Hello and welcome to Round Table. Russian soldiers have been gathering in Belarus for the past month, reopening a debate about what exact role Minsk is playing in the Ukraine conflict. Belarusian troops have not been actively involved in the fighting, but the country still serves as a launch pad for Russian attacks. And thousands more of Moscow's troops are set to be deployed along the border with Ukraine. So does Belarus's president, Alexander Lukashenko, simply take his orders from the Kremlin? Or is he playing a much more complex geopolitical game? Good to have you along. I'm David Foster. Belarus's leader has been branded by some as Europe's last dictator, and he is, on the face of it, a firm supporter of Vladimir Putin and the attack on Ukraine. Belarus remains a key staging ground for Russian missiles and troops being sent into Ukraine. But Minsk insists the joint troop deployments with Russia are simply defensive and that its soldiers will not go over the border. However, Lukashenko has kept his exact strategy characteristically ambiguous. Well, we spoke about this to Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, leader of the Belarusian opposition movement in exile. Uh, Putin supported Lukashenko politically and economically back in 2020. And since then, uh, they have you know, a kind of symbiotic or fake friendship. They just are using each other. Lukashenko needs uh, Putin as a political backup, and uh, Putin needs Lukashenko as uh, the only ally in this war against uh, Ukrainians. First of all, I have to say that the fates of Belarus and Ukraine are intertwined. Uh, the victory of Ukraine will mean... Uh, the triumph of democratic Belarus too, and vice versa, Belarus is in the interest, uh, free Belarus is in the interest of Ukraine and the entire democratic world. Uh, we have to understand that Lukashenko is already participating in this war. Uh, he gave our land, uh, our infrastructure for uh, Russian troops, and he has to uh, bear the full responsibility for his war crimes and crimes against uh, uh, Belarusian people as well. So, uh, but there are no anti-Ukrainian moods in Belarusian society. 86% of Belarusian people are uh, opposing the fact that uh, Belarusian troops might participate in this war, uh, and our soldiers don't want to fight with Ukrainians, our close nation, just for uh, ambitions of two usurpers. So I really very doubt that uh, our Belarusian soldiers would um, uh, cross the border with Ukraine. But of course, uh, Lukashenko has to show loyalty to Putin day after day, and uh, our land for sure uh, can be used for uh, future possible attacks on Ukraine. We can now go into this in a bit more detail out of Poland, Warsaw to be precise. Hanna Ljubakova joins us. She's from the Atlantic Council. Then we go to London and Katia Glod is there. She's from the Center for European Policy Analysis and in Berlin. Valery Kavlyowski, who's representative of foreign affairs in the United Transitional Cabinet of Belarus. That is the group that is pulled together by Svetlana Tikhonovskaya, who we've just heard from. Valery, let me come to you first of all. I think it must be three years since I first spoke to somebody from your group on this program about how you were going to topple Lukashenko. He is still there. He still runs things in Belarus. First of all, why have you not been able to bring him down? And because of that, how much of what he does is up to him and how much of it is up to Moscow and the Kremlin? Is, is he in Putin's pocket? First question is, why haven't you been able to get rid of him? Oh, uh, he is definitely in stress uh, in two and a uh, uh, half years uh, since the elections. Uh, he has never established full control over the society, over the situation in Belarus, and uh, this makes him very nervous. And we see this nervousness uh, uh, in, in the continued repressions uh, against Belarusians, against all the strata of the society. At the same time, he has made a series of really bold and uh, uh, grave mistakes, uh, like landing the Ryanair flight, like uh, engineering the uh, migration crisis on the border with you. And finally, he went to the war with uh, Ukraine, 
uh, only to uh, sort of assert that he is in control, that he is somebody who can uh, make problems for the West, but also he can bring solutions uh, for the West. So okay, so, so why is it in his interest to cooperate with Vladimir Putin if he is so much in control? And when Putin says, uh, I want to move more troops into your country, surely he knows the risks that that entails. Why doesn't he just say no? Well, in the first place, he is very dependent on Russia, and this dependence he has developed over decades uh, of his rule. But also importantly, that Lukashenko is anti-Ukrainian, uh, because he does not want a Ukraine that is free, democratic, and European. This is the model that is a threat uh, to uh, to the model of Lukashenko and to Putin, and this is why uh, this decision to go to war uh, against Ukraine has been made by both these men. Hannah, let me come to you. You're Belarusian. You, you've been out of the country for a couple of years, maybe a bit more than that now. But now you see perhaps a larger troop build up on, on the border with, with Ukraine. What, what does that tell you about what's happening in your country? So most recently we heard about this new uh, military uh, uh, like joint forces, uh, the creation of this group in Belarus when uh, Russian soldiers came back to the territory of Belarus, right? Since February, there were tens of thousands of them, but then many of them had to leave. Uh, so they came back and I think uh, many immediately had questions whether this would mean another attempt, another attack from the north. On Ukraine, uh, so far, we don't really see that this group of forces is ready to attack. But of course, this is something to sort of make Ukraine worry and weaken the successful counteroffensive in uh, on the south and southeast of Ukraine. So the Ukrainian army will be constantly, you know, feel threatened from the north and regroup and try to protect uh, the north. This is borders. partly because the Ukrainians cannot leave that that part of the border unpatrolled, uh, undefended. I'm going to make some comments about the troops that Russia is said to have there now from the Belarusian Defence Ministry. 9,000 Russian troops, 170 tanks, 200 armoured combat vehicles and 100 gun and mortar emplacements. Now, we're going to look at a map. This is from February of this year from the Council for Foreign Relations, which shows how close they may well be um, to the border. What sort of threat do those numbers and those positions, Hannah, do you think pose? Uh, well, being no military analyst, I think 9,000 might not be enough. But of course, uh, this is again a threat, right? And I think the Ukrainians uh, are speaking about this as a threat, though they also said that this might not mean the immediate attack at this stage. But let's not uh, think that uh, the Kremlin abandoned the plans to um, to, to invade Ukraine from, from the north, because that's the quickest way to Kiev, to the capital. So... Um, I think for everybody, this uh, we should be definitely looking at this space really closely. OK, uh, Hannah, I know you're in a busy, busy room, hence the background noise. We forgive you for that. Let me come to you, Katter, if, if I may. Um, one of the things that we've been hearing about is that the Belarusian foreign minister, uh, that is Vladimir Makai, died in unexplained circumstances fairly recently, and some suggestions that he may have been going to Poland perhaps to make Belarusian peace, if you, if you like, with the West. And that may have led to his, his downfall. I know that's just a rumour, but does it point to anything inside the Lukashenko regime that is shaky? Um, I don't think it does. Um, I don't believe in these con uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, um, we know that Mr. McKay was a very uh, um, good servant to Mr. Lukashenko. He has not shown any independence before. Um, he was very good following the party line or the line of Alexander Lukashenko. So I very much doubt that he would take any steps independently and try to establish some um, links to Poland or to the West. Of course, that does not mean that the whole regime is very monolithic and that it fully supports Lukashenko. In fact, from the public polls, which to some extent also reflects the uh, uh, moods within the regime, we know that the overwhelming majority of people in Belarus do not support this war and they do not want to see uh, um, Belarus being dragged into it. And I believe the same mood, as I said, is also within the regime of Alexander Lukashenko. Yet, 
um, these people are too timid, they're too shy, and they they fear that Lukashenko has power to destroy them. So therefore, I don't think we will see any revolt against uh, um, Alexander Lukashenko in the near future. So one of the things that I've been hearing from the opposition movement, Valerie, and you can come back on this in just a moment, but I'm still talking to Katia. One of the things I've been hearing from the opposition movement for a number of years now is, yes, you don't see protests on the streets, but we're very, very well organised Locally, we have protests in this district, we have protests in, in that district. It's just that the cameras don't turn up. So you think, and I'm putting words in your mouth here, that the opposition's pretty flimsy, is it? I think that we have not seen any large-scale protests in Belarus since uh, um, the end of 2020. We did see about uh, um, a thousand people, 700 people to be precise, according to Amnesty International, who were arrested in February after Russia invaded Ukraine and people showed up to protest. Um, it's very difficult for the opposition to get to the regime in Belarus. As I said, people are very scared, people within power, they're very scared, particularly having Russian troops on the ground, that any attempt to negotiate with the opposition um, may, be, uh, um, may be stopped. At the same time, of course, the opposition itself has been focusing its strategy on the outside of Belarus. They don't really have a lot of means, but they perhaps could have tried better to reach out to society inside the country. OK, when I was putting up that map that showed the, the troop positions and, and mentioned some troop numbers, how much of a reinforcement of, of the Russian, if you like, positions within Belarus is this? Is it, is it a big change? No, I don't think it's a big change. I think it's uh, still not the numbers that Russia would probably need to try and invade uh, um, Ukraine once again. But we are seeing uh, um, Belarus being very helpful to Russia in a multitude of ways, like training Russian troops. I think all those people who you mentioned at the beginning of the program, Russian soldiers who have arrived in Belarus, they are being trained. They are mobilized newly, so-called newly mobilized Russian soldiers. We are also seeing uh, um, different uh, uh, military exercises that Belarus is doing together with Russia inside Belarus and outside of the country. And we have seen uh, um, huge numbers uh, um, of ammunition and military equipment being sent from Belarus to Russia. And of course, Belarus is helping with logistics. We are hearing uh, um, accounts of um, some Belarusian companies even making uniform for Russian soldiers. So I think Belarus has done enough without having joined directly the war, it has been major help to Belarus and that should not be under, to Russia, sorry, and that should not be underestimated. Valerie, so we hear from Katya that there is unlikely, in her opinion, to be a conspiracy behind the death of the Belarusian foreign minister, Vladimir Makai, but I want to ask you about specifics here. Um, he was to have had a meeting with Sergei Lavrov, the Russian foreign minister, the day after he died was no bull, obviously, to make that. He was going to Poland to a meeting of the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, suggestions that he may have been wanting to make Belarusian peace with the West. What are your views on any cracks within the regime and, and indeed, Mr. Makai's demise? Uh, I do not see any cracks, any visible cracks, at least. Uh, these engagements that you have just mentioned there, uh, with Lavrov, they're quite regular for Mackay. This is uh, this is not something unusual. Uh, that Mackay would go to Poland for the OSCE Ministerial Council. Uh, uh, this this also didn't wasn't supposed to bring any breakthroughs uh, in the relations between uh, the Democratic West and the uh, authoritarian regime of Lukashenko. Uh, uh, Mackay went uh, to the same council last year in Stockholm. Uh, he was in New York for the high level uh, week of the United Nations General Assembly. And uh, he didn't bring any fruits from there. And uh, by now, we don't see any indicators that uh, the West is willing to re-engage with Lukashenko as he is now. Okay. He continues repression. Right. So his role in the war uh, continues to be really high. Yeah, you, you've both knocked that on the head now, so we'll push it to one side. But I want to ask this. Um, what is in it for Belarus if it allows Russian forces to go from its territory into Ukraine, or indeed if it sends its own Belarusian forces into Ukraine. What would be any reason for Lukashenko to agree to that? 
the reason would be uh, to see a threat from Ukraine, which is not there. Uh, I don't see any objective reason for uh, for this to happen, especially when we speak about the Belarusian forces. <clears throat> Belarusian society is uh, overwhelmingly against this. 86% of Belarusians say they are against uh, sending Belarusian troops uh, to Ukraine. Um, uh, what could force him uh, is that he is completely dependent uh, on, on Putin and he cannot resist the pressure from them anymore. And then uh, he he sends the troops again. He is doing what uh, what the Kremlin tells him to do. But what was uh, stopping this from happening? What was preventing the Belarusian troops from being sent to Ukraine is exactly the mood of the Belarusian society. But, but, but why? Uh, but why? Why is he completely dependent, as as you put it, on, on Putin? Because this is the nub of it all, isn't it? Uh, well, in the first place, he lost legitimacy in Belarus. He stopped talking to people. He doesn't have any respect, any trust with the Belarusian people. He doesn't have the mandate uh, from Belarusians. Second, he lost completely uh, any connections uh, with the international community. There are no friends, no allies for Lukashenko. He cannot fall back on anyone for support, for political or financial or military support. That's why he is there out in the open, uh, kind of facing uh, Putin and uh, all his assertiveness, all his... Uh, aggressive and hostile behavior towards not only uh, Ukraine, but uh, Belarus as well. And the troops we're seeing right now accumulated in Belarus, this is not only to threaten Ukraine, this is also to establish control over Belarus by Russia. OK, OK, I, I, I get where you're so, coming from. You're the opposition. You're obviously going to have a contrary point of view. But um, the suggestion from Valerie there, um, Hannah, if I may, that um, he is reliant, that's Lukashenko, on financial and military support from Russia. How much has that increased? Um, so, of course, it, it did increase. Lukashenko recently doesn't really have an alternative. He doesn't really have a choice uh, because he became so toxic for any of his partners in the West, but also, uh, for example, in Azerbaijan or even in China, right? Because, well, Lukashenko is no longer reliable. The economy is no longer stable. And uh, the country became a co-aggressor in the war against Ukraine. So, of course, naturally, uh, he lost his uh, former, I would say, creditors, uh, those sort of countries that were able to support him before. Uh, and I don't even mean the democratic countries in the West. And, of course, Belarus at the moment, because of Lukashenko, lost sovereignty in so many spheres, including military, economic, but also information and, uh, um, like, foreign affairs here, right? Because, while well, Lukashenko is no longer decisive here. Belarus doesn't have any foreign policy except uh, for its relations with uh, Russia. Uh, so this is all, of course, affects, uh, affects the country really badly. And uh, people also feel the consequences of both sanctions, right. but also the so, war. So you, you're suggesting that he's isolated, which leads me, Katya, to this. This is from a Belarusian political analyst who works for the Carnegie and Diamond for International Peace, Ertyom Shrebman. And this person writes, of course Putin has a lot of leverage, but he cannot compel Lukashenko to commit political suicide. That is why I think Lukashenko will definitely try to resist any push into a full war. A fair assessment or not? I think it is a fair assessment, but to that, I think we should also add that probably Putin himself does not really consider sending Belarusian troops to Ukraine being a great benefit to Russia. I think Putin does think that Belarusian troops, and let's be clear with the numbers here, we know that Belarusian army is quite small. The one part of which, which is capable and has some sort of relative relatively good equipment is about seven to eight thousand people and it even that part does not have any combat experience so probably for putin having these people arrived in ukraine being shot dead and then coming back in belarus in coffin so to say that could definitely be a big liability because it will will definitely destabilize regime in uh, belarus people are um the 25 30 percent support that lukashenko has today it will very likely disappear and we even don't know what these uh, um, belarusian troops might do in ukraine we have seen in the recent polls that only 18 percent of the belarusian public think that Belarusian troops will actually fight in Ukraine. So that does suggest that Although many there think are that supposedly they... Belarusian volunteers who are fighting in U Ukraine at the moment. Y your assessment leads me to ask this question.
which has been posed by a number of people more au fait with what's going on than I am. If Lukashenko sends his forces into Ukraine, then there's a very real possibility that he will lose, and he will lose face, which will make him more dependent on Putin than ever before. Is that too Machiavellian? I think to some extent you're right, but we should not forget that um, if Lukashenko loses face, he's very likely to lose power in Belarus because we might easily see the new protests emerging. We might see Belarusian troops actually joining the Ukrainian army. Um, we might see the conflict spreading into Belarus. And then Putin has lost Belarus, not only as an airline, but it lost it also as a platform from which it can uh, shoot missile, it can uh, um, host, uh, it can, that, that all the Russian equipment can be stored and um, um, fly into Ukraine and obviously the military ground. So that would be a huge um, defeat for Putin as well. And then, uh, of course, we can say that potentially any destabilization, any uh, protest might spread even further east okay. to Russia. OK, so I'm trying to put everything into context, and you've been brilliant so far, all of you, at, at helping me understand this. If what you say, Katya, is correct, if your analysis is that uh, it probably wouldn't be good for Lukashenko to go into Belarus because he could lose face, he could lose power, why is Ukraine's president, Vladimir Zelensky, saying this? Russia is trying to directly draw Belarus into this war, playing a provocation that we are allegedly preparing an attack on this country. So he says Russia's doing it deliberately. Your point, and you too, Valerie, you first cat here, is that it just isn't worth Russia trying to get him into this position because he could lose face and he could be out of power and Russia would lose an ally. Well, we don't really know what Russia is thinking. This is all what we have said uh, has been uh, really our assumption. But we know that situation changes very quickly on the ground. If Russia is uh, uh, past this winter uh, losing more territory and has to retreat, we don't know what kind of crazy plans Putin might have for that. He might decide that Belarus, uh, that Russia would need to try and take over Kyiv again. And from that perspective, Belarus is very convenient location to do that. So indeed, um, we don't know what's happening, but Belarus is still very useful um, for Putin at this stage. Okay, and Valerie, Valerie talking, talking for the opposition, sorry to interrupt you, but time, time is our enemy. Um, who's trying to provoke who here? We have Zelensky saying that um, what is happening is that uh, Russia's trying to draw Belarus into the war by suggesting that we want to attack Belarus, that is, that Ukraine wants to attack Belarus. Who's playing the big, long PR game here, Ukraine or Russia? Well, I think that uh, President Zelensky is trying to drive a wedge uh, between Lukashenko and Putin, uh, sort of uh, trying to uh, to present uh, Lukashenko with some kind of agency and with the belief that he is capable of uh, uh, making his own independent decisions, which is uh, rather doubtful. Uh, as far as Russia is concerned, uh, they want to win the war. This is rather apparent. And they also want to keep Belarus by its side, to keep Lukashenko by its side. And sending Belarusian troops into Ukraine would tarnish uh, the relations between Belarus and Saint Ukrainians, and that would be a good story for Putin. Uh, this means that the uh, Belarusian regime and Belarusian people essentially would be much closer to Russians, and that would is establish a stronger control over Belarus, uh, again, uh, spoiling the relations between Belarusians and Ukrainians for, for years and decades to come. OK, and the bigger picture, Hannah, and we're going to be closing out the programme in just a moment, as we bring up the map once again, is that any conflict that directly involves Belarus um, risks drawing in other NATO members such as Latvia and Lithuania, which share a border with Belarus, it could become a much wider conflict. I think, uh, well, the regime in Belarus in general became uh, so dangerous for uh, its neighbors, for Lithuanians, for, for, for the Poles and Latvians and so on, right? Because of uh, the migration crisis, because of the Ryanair hijack, and, and that was even before the war. So I think uh, even in 2020, it was clear that uh, the internal political and human rights crisis is actually a problem for the region and also for the continent. So the war now only shows that uh, 
the well, pro-democracy activists in 2020 were actually right that Lukashenko is no longer an internal Belarusian problem. Okay, quick one from you, if, if I may, Katya. Um, do you think Lukashenko will stay out of this as much as he can, um, even though he may be getting some pressure from, from Moscow, but he would be wise to keep his nose out of everything Ukrainian if he can? Yes, he will definitely try to stay out of it as much as possible. He will definitely try also to help Russia in covert ways, but without really sending the troops over. But ultimately, it will depend on Putin whether Belarusian troops will go into Ukraine or not. You've all been brilliant. Thank you very much for helping me to understand this. It is a very complicated picture. I hope you, wherever you're watching this edition of Roundtable, come away a little bit clearer about what is happening in a very muddy world. From me, David Foster, from the Roundtable team, until next time, goodbye.